in the last class we had studied regarding the uh, basics of engineering seismology and uh, we had uh, discussed uh, what are the uh, four different aspects one was the earth structure then the basics of earthquake and then how you can measure uh, earthquake and then we had also discussed regarding the seismotectonic uh, activity or seismotectonic features of india okay so today we shall be concentrating on the ground motion as such in which we earthquake engineers are more interested okay so in this uh, topic we shall be discussing about what do you mean by a strong ground motion strong ground motion then the factors affecting the ground motion then the ground motion characteristics which will be a very important topic and then finally the design ground motion parameters this i'll not be going into much detail maybe while coming to the design part we shall discuss more about that part okay now strong ground motion you see as i told you uh, when the corresponding seismic waves as such the energy that is released from an earthquake it is uh, very high and it travels through large distances to reach the site okay and as it since the seismic waves has both vertical as well as horizontal components and they arrive at the corresponding time carrying different what you call levels of energy okay and they have different levels of energy and they come at different times okay depending upon how the waves come maybe the first the p waves will come and the s waves will come then the surface will come so they arrive at different times and they carry different levels of energy okay so as such the motion that occurs at a site is very random okay with the corresponding amplitude and the direction keeps on varying with time it is not a single uh, a single uh, what you call uh, value or single type of acceleration or single type of displacement it ke it keeps on varying depending upon how the different waves interact with each other because there's also interactions with, between the waves how the way the distance traveled by the waves uh, are different by the p waves s waves and the surface waves so all this will result in a very random nature of the earthquake okay so and you see all the corresponding uh, what you called vibrations we may not feel it okay some are very small that uh, we will not be even able to feel it and that such corresponding small feeble earthquakes are of interest only to seismologists okay where they want they have to look into uh, the finding the epicenter and any other what you call uh, study of the earth structure etc or the corresponding tectonic features etc but for as engineers okay we are concerned with only the corresponding motion that affects the life and the environment okay life and property okay and that corresponding motion is called as strong brown ground motion that means a motion that exceeds a threshold limit that will affect the structures and the people okay so as such we are interested in only those aspects of motion which is called as strong ground motion now what are the factors that affect the ground motion okay what are the factors that affect the ground motion first of all the first is the source characteristics okay so as such depending upon the magnitude of the earthquake okay magnitude of the earthquake in the sense how strong how much energy is released uh, that depends upon the ground uh, that affects the ground motion okay now the magnitude itself depends upon the shape of the fault its area how much it has been dislocated what is the stress drop etc etc we are not going to that part but as such the motion at a site depends upon the magnitude of the earthquake and then it also depends upon the duration of the earthquake these both are the source characteristics okay from where the earthquake has generated now the second one is the distance characteristics means how far is the corresponding site away from the epicenter 
so the motion of the ground motion as such will depend upon the distance from the epicenter and how depth the focus is from the earth's surface okay and besides that it also depends upon the elastic properties of the material through which the waves pass okay the waves travel uh, in different directions and the speed the corresponding attenuation characteristics the damping etc all depends upon the material properties so that also <coughs> affects the uh, the ground motion okay at a site the third one is the local site characteristics okay now the local conditions of the site will also affect the dynamic characteristics of motion the dynamic characteristics include the amplitude the frequency content the duration of strong motion etc okay this also the this also gets affected due to the local site conditions and some of the common local site conditions that affect this uh, ground motion are the topographic effects the basin effects and the lateral discontinuity effects so we shall discuss each of these in detail okay first is topographic effects now as i told you the um, the amplitude and the frequency okay of uh, the ground motion the amplitude and frequency of the ground motion are dependent upon how the corresponding angles reach the surface means they depends upon the azimuth as well as the angle of how the incidence wave means the first coming waves okay so it depends upon the azimuth as well as the angle of the incidence waves okay now with increase in the ang angle of incidence of the body waves when the corresponding angle of incidence increases then the acceleration decreases okay acceleration decreases now also besides another factor that takes it happens is that some of these incident waves the first waves may what called may get uh, reflected and they may interact with the outgoing in diffracted waves means the waves which come okay and the waves which had diffracted from the surface these two may interact okay resulting in a more complications okay uh, so as such this also happens depending upon how these wa the waves that are coming from the uh, initial uh, for the first and the waves that are uh, deflected or diffracted back from the surface these two also may interact okay so that is also creates complications okay now the uh, this corresponding interaction as such okay results in the focusing and defocusing means the what you called like you have see they cancel out each other or they may enhance okay they cancel out each other is called focusing or defocusing so this corresponding effects of focusing and defocusing are maximum for normal incident of waves means if the corresponding waves are perpendicular normal then the effects of focusing and defocusing are very large okay and with the increase in angle of incidences as the angle incidence means the angle at which the waves come as the value of it increases then the corresponding effects of focusing and defocusing will reduce okay now azimuth also similarly affects the focusing effects but not to that very extent now the next aspect is uh, regarding the crust and what you call the valleys okay the crust and ridges in the surface topography you see in general the near the crust of a ridge of a ridge means like a mountainous region you see there is an amplification amplification of the waves that happen causing more damage to the buildings that are located at the hilltops okay the maximum amplification is usually given as 2p by phi okay this also phi where phi is not 2p it is 2 pi okay it is 2 pi by phi where phi is the crust angle the top angle and 
that corresponding uh, uh, as the corresponding crust angle uh, uh, sorry as this uh, amplification increases more damage gets created on the buildings are located at the uh, top of the hills okay second one is deamplification okay in case you have a valley in case you have a valley then there is a deamplification means the reduction of the corresponding effect of the seismic waves compared to that at the top by a factor of 2 pi by 5 okay where phi is the crust angle you can see the crust angle here shown here okay the crust angle now now there are certain other aspects also depending upon how the slope okay depending upon how the slope is the angle of inclination of the slope also that amplification and deamplification uh, amplification gets affected we are not going to much detail regarding the uh, topographic effects it's a detailed what you call research study as such so we are not going to that part but one thing you have to remember in mind is that the effects of topographic are highly complicated okay and depending upon the geometry depending upon the type of irregularity the, these waves will interact with each other you see all these amplification deamplification or focusing or defocusing all happens due to the interaction between the waves okay the coming waves and the diffracted waves so as such these are complex uh, complex and it becomes difficult to assess them properly a few of the researches has been conducted in order to study these corresponding behaviors okay the next is the basin or the soil effects now the basin or soil effects as such means the corresponding uh, ground motion depends upon the properties of the basin or soil we call it basin uh, as such because you see uh, it's actually the soil usually the corresponding uh, what you call a city is located most cities are located either in river valleys or over young soft soil okay uh, means in most of the lower lying areas is where cities usually are uh, formed or cities are usually flourished so as such the corresponding deposits of the soil there is comparatively uh, young as well as soft compared to that of the mountainous regions where you can observe hard rocks so as such the soil effects needs also uh, the soil properties also affects the uh, ground motion behaviors now the basin effect as such includes a number of it means it's dependent upon a number of factors the impedance contrast the resonance damping the basin edge as well as trapping of waves okay we shall discuss each of these now well, impedance contrast means contrast means difference okay you see seismic waves will travel faster in hard rocks than in softer rocks and sediments okay so what happens is that uh, when a corresponding seismic waves pass from a hard medium to a soft medium okay the hard medium to a soft medium their amplitude will increase so as the, i mean so that the amount of energy remains the same okay their amplitude will increase us to carry the same amount of energy the amplitude will increase so due to this increase in amplitude okay the corresponding site ha will have a stronger shaking because the amplitude is higher in case of areas with are soft okay if this site is having softer soil layers then the shaking becomes more stronger okay because the amplitude has increased okay this is called impedance effect the next is resonance okay now what happens is that you see as i told you each uh, a material has its gone resonance property you have already studied of uh, resonance in your lower classes so when the incoming uh, seismic wave frequency is equivalent to the fundamental frequency of the soil the 
okay when the coming seismic wave frequency is equal to the fundamental frequency of the soil that is already present then it will drastically increase the ground motion means it will greatly amplify the ground motion okay so as such you can see that uh, uh, there is a great uh, what you called rise in the uh, amplitudes of the corresponding seismic waves at that point okay now usually uh, the imprints uh, means that what you see in a corresponding spectral uh, diagram we can see a large number of peaks and these corresponding peaks usually characterized the resonance patterns okay the resonance means how it has been amplified okay the third is damping so you see the seismic waves also gets dampened or we call it attenuated okay due to the imperfect elastic properties of the medium okay which is called as inelastic damping so damping the corresponding waves may also gets deamplified or die down so uh, means the amplitude gets reduced depending upon the damping of the soil uh, so it means the damping of the seismic waves due to the characteristics of the soil okay so the damping of seismic waves is usually described by a parameter called the quality factor which is defined as the fractional loss of energy per cycle okay per in one cycle as such what is the amount of energy loss that is how we express the damping of seismic waves which is called as a quality factor determined by or expressed or uh, denoted by the letter capital q the next one is basin edge now it has been observed that you see the damages of uh, the damages gets more concentrated near the edges of the basin it just means at the end, uh, ends of the basin okay because of the strong generation of the surface waves that is located at the edge okay now this surface waves usually start from the edge of the basin okay and then they move inwards okay so when frequency content means the surface waves usually gets generated when the frequency content in the body or in the p waves or s waves exceeds a fundamental frequency of the soil and their amplitude decreases with increase in edge slope okay so as such when the when the corresponding uh, what you call the frequency content of the seismic wave that comes is greater than the fundamental frequency of the soil not equal to when it is equal to then uh, again there is a corresponding resonance effect but when it is greater than the corresponding fundamental frequency of the soil then what happens is that the amplitude will be decrease okay with the increase in the edge slope as the slope is keeps on increasing the amplitude will keep on decreasing okay when it is equal to when the corresponding uh, free frequency content of the seismic waves is equal to the uh, fundamental frequency of the soil then it is resonance but if it is greater than that okay in that case depending upon the edge slope okay depending upon the edge slope it will be decreasing not increasing okay this is called the basin edge and finally the trapping of waves okay you see the curvature of the basin also affects the corresponding means the, the curvature of basin will result in the trapping of the body waves okay and this will result in the body waves that will pass through that soil instead of getting fully diffracted or uh, out of the uh, out of that layer it will pass through the entire alluvial or entire soil layer okay so as such this corresponding trapping of this if actually it should have gone outside it should have uh, really uh, means should refracted from the surface and uh, went back to the earth but due to the trapping of that uh, what you called uh, the waves what happens is that it will cause very strong shaking on the surface okay and this will affect for longer durations okay compared to that of the vertical uh, waves okay usually this happens when the angle of is uh, uh, 
very large compared to the with respect to the vertical okay this is called the trapping of waves so these are some of the uh, basin effects okay i had discussed five basin effects okay damping resonance trapping of phase impedance contrast and uh, basin edge okay these are the local site uh, effects in the basin of soil effects the third local site effects as i told you is the lateral discontinuity effects now lateral discontinuities are locations where a softer material lies beside a more harder material means when a, besides is more uh, rigid material so what happens is that in such cases you see uh, there is an increase in the damage along that discontinuity okay there is an increase in damage along that discontinuity later means so there is a difference in the so there is a small thin layer of what i call not thin layer a small area narrow area where the corresponding uh, soil is softer it may be extending maybe hundreds of kilometers also it depends upon the uh, this uh, what i called it depends upon uh, the area the topography area. for this corresponding lateral discontinuity or the softer material may extend hundreds of kilometers it's like a thin area thin the sense not maybe 1 kilometer or 2 kilometer uh, maybe what you called distance and uh, uh, in along the width okay and as such it may extend up to maybe 100 kilometers or 50 kilometers depending upon how it is okay so it has been observed that in those areas the damage to the structures are more uh, what you called means the damage is more dangerous and dangerous the damage is more severe okay because there is a amplification of the amplitude okay and also due to a local surface waves that gets generated in the softer media okay a local surface wave uh, i'll show you show you figure for example there is a hard rock like this okay this is a hard rock okay this is a corresponding soft rock okay then may extend maybe 5 kilometers or to maybe 10 kilometers and the length may be 100 kilometers or less depending upon how it is okay so all the corresponding uh, structures are located in this corresponding region will get more damaged okay due to the amplitude of the correspond amplification of the uh, seismic waves at this corresponding soil and local waves gets generated in this area okay this is called as lateral discontinuity effects so uh, we have studied what are the factors that affect the ground motion okay what are the factors that affect the ground motion okay. now as i told you uh, now we shall look into some of the ground motion characteristics or it is better called as strong ground motion characteristics okay because we are concerned with only the strong motion okay so instead of uh, just ground motion where we call it strong ground motion characteristics okay now as earthquake engineers yes as sir actually they are also want to be join the class so please allow him. hold on who is coming sir they are yadav Uh, tell him to join once again okay sir okay. there yada we are here is online okay okay now the ground motion characteristics so uh, since we are invested only in strong ground motion for for we uh, engineers as such for so structural engineers or earthquake engineers as such uh, we are interested only in certain characteristics 
okay and the most interest to us are three one is the peak ground motion characteristics okay and then the duration of the strong motion and the frequency content okay these are the three param characteristics which are of interest to us okay for earthquake engineering applications okay now we shall discuss each of these separately now first one is the peak ground motion now the motion of the earth as such we know that can be described either in terms of acceleration or in terms of velocity or in terms of displacement okay either in terms of acceleration velocity or displacement now acceleration as you know is uh, we can obtain from accelerographs or accelerometers okay displacement we get in from seismographs okay so uh, but uh, as i told you as earthquake engineers we are concerned more with the acceleration aspect because that gives a better idea of uh, what the uh, amount of uh, what you call uh, energy that is uh, affecting the uh, the structures as such so what happens is that in most cases nowadays what is done is that we place accelerograms instead of uh, sorry accelerographs instead of seismographs and then the velocity parameters and displacement parameters are usually derived from the acceleration graphs okay okay so if we usually at the instrument station we prefer accelerometers or accelerographs okay which will give you an accelerogram okay so from that accelerogram okay we determine the velocity and displacement by certain calculations this is what is usually done nowadays okay so for structural engineering purposes acceleration gives the best measure of the earthquake's intensity okay because that is what uh, we would prefer as uh, structural engineers now the ground velocity the velocity is actually a measure that is related to the energy that is transmitted to the structures and the intensity of the damage caused and the displacement is as uh, usually preferred if you are designing underground structures because underground structures as such uh, uh, it will be a constant uh, means it will be a long structure like uh, pipelines or tunnels or such aspects and here the displacement is a more critical effect that disturbs those structures okay because because underground structures we are not concerned uh, we are concerned only with the displacement the other will not be it will affect but not that as much okay now remember one thing at each of the instrument station we are uh, instrument station where we keep these accelerographs or seismographs or whatever it is or the ground motions are recorded in all three directions okay in the two horizontal directions okay and in the vertical directions means the three orthogonal directions we record the corresponding motion not only in one uh, one direction not only in the horizontal but also in the vertical okay and as i told you earlier usually the directly measured quantity is the acceleration okay directly measured quantity is the acceleration and the rest of the parameters that is uh, displacement as well as velocity are usually derived from that but you can also you can uh, you can also have instruments that measure the displacement and velocity directly okay that also can be kept at an instrument station okay now the earthquake uh, you know we shall be discussing more about uh, the first aspect the ground peak ground acceleration okay now the earthquake acceleration the ground acceleration is as i told you is very random okay and as such we cannot predict it okay the corresponding uh, location will have this this type of acceleration so if you draw the if you take the accelerogram okay and the area under a pulse a pulse is actually means a what you call an increase in uh, i'll show you oh yeah 
this is a pulse okay a one one pulse second pulse third pulse fourth pulse this each of these are called pulses so the area under the pulse is a measure of the vibrations that is transmitted to the structure okay and the amplitude of a pulse is the measure of the severity of the ground shaking at that instant okay so as such you have pulse a pulse as such if i take the area under the pulse that corresponding area will give you the uh, vibration that is transmitted into the structure okay and the amplitude of a pulse is the measure of the c amplitude means i hope you understand by the term amplitude okay the amplitude of the pulse is the measure of the severity of the ground shaking how far, how great is the amplitude that much severe is the corresponding shake at that time okay now as i told you we get an accelerograph from an accelerograph or accelerometer now usually the as i told you accelerogram consists of a pulse okay of various durations basically uh, if you see the accelerogram of any of the earthquakes okay it will have three distinct part a part of rise then an area where there is a strong motion and then finally a part of rise here a strong motion and then finally a decay okay the rise is usually when the corresponding uh, p waves and s waves first comes the strong motion occurs when the corresponding surface waves uh, uh, come and um, come to the site and then finally it will die down okay now it is not only amplitude i told you it is not only the amplitude that is important the frequency is also important Okay, amplitude means the highest value of acceleration. That is not sufficient. Means that is alone is not sufficient. We also require what is the frequency content. Frequency content means as such how close these pulses are, or within one within an interval of time, how much cycles has occurred. Okay, and re remember one thing: you can see from this figure itself that it is very random. Okay, it's not because it is not a deterministic value. Okay, it is a very random one as such, the earthquake accelerogram. Okay, now each accelerogram, each accelerogram carries certain distinct information. Okay, with regards to the shaking, okay, the amplitude, the duration, the frequency content, and the energy. Okay, all these aspects can be obtained. From a single accelerogram, okay, we can get an idea. We can get an information regarding the amplitude, the duration, the frequency content, the energy, etc. These aspects are embedded in the accelerogram. So studying the accelerograms will help you understand the characteristics of that earthquake or the characteristics of that ground motion. Okay. Now. The horizontal, you see, as I told you, the acceleration as such has uh, three directions. You usually uh, in uh, accelerograms, there will be accelerograms in all three directions: the horizontal, vertical, horizontal in two directions, as well as the vertical. And sometimes when it's reported, all these are uh, mixed together, and the highest value as such that corresponding graph is usually reported, and the highest is usually in the horizontal direction. Now the horizontal co component of acceleration is primarily used to report the ground motion. We usually prefer the horizontal component because that affects the structures more, okay, compared to that of the vertical ones, okay. And the structures as such are designed for the horizontal component as well as the vertical component also. But horizontal component is much greater compared to that of the vertical component. Now vertical component as such we don't need to look much into it because we already designed the structures for the gravity loads means we already designed the structures for the vertical loads so just a slight increase in the safety factor is sufficient uh, to take into account for the vertical uh, loads but the horizontal loads is much more 
much more detailed. We require a greater analysis of structure. So as such, uh, when we will come to that part later when we design structures. So we are concerned more regarding the horizontal component compared to that of the vertical component. Okay. Now, one thing it is noticed that the vertical component is having a higher frequencies compared to that of the horizontal components. It has been noted that the vertical component of the ground isolation is richer in higher frequencies, okay, compared to that of the horizontal ones. Now, the common amplitude measure, as, as I told you, uh, there is a corresponding in the accelerogram, corresponding different amplitudes at different instant of time. So the largest value of amplitude, okay, the largest value of amplitude in this accelerogram is called as peak ground, peak ground acceleration. Okay, the largest value among the different pulses, the largest amplitude one is called the peak ground acceleration or PGA. Okay, so he see in this corresponding figure here, okay. So as such, you can see in the earlier figure also. You see here, it, here it is 0, 1, minus 1. This indicates how much times, okay, it is actually 1G or 2G or 3G, etc. So a horizontal value of say 0.5G or 1G, it actually means 0.5 times the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, 0.5 times the acceleration due to gravity. That is how astrograms are. Uh, usually represented it means that is the way in which they are represented. So 0.5 times the acceleration due to gravity. That means that the movement of the ground can cause a maximum horizontal force on rigid structure equal to 50 percentage of its weight. Okay, when that corresponding uh, 0.5 g value strikes, okay, that means that it is equal to a force that is equal to 50 percentage of the weight that is a horizontal value of force that gets uh, uh, that gets striking on the corresponding structure so 1g 2g you can see the isograms will be represented like that okay better figure is shown here okay acceleration see so you can see it is 0.2g here approximately the peak ground here it is more than that here it is 0.3 approximately here is much more less than 0.2, etc. Okay. Now you see, if you see this, this actually the three different components that is measured. Okay. So here you can see this is the two horizontal ones which are having comparatively larger values, and the third one is the vertical one which is comparatively smaller values almost equal but uh, comparatively slow, uh, having lesser value of acceleration compared to the horizontal components so these are the three components of the motion that is recorded in utkarshi and here as such the different utkarshi is already here okay besides that a few other accelerograms of the different earthquakes of the past has already been given here okay this an Fernando earthquake, the Imperial Valley earthquake, the Mexico earthquake, which was very famous. Okay, so these are also some of the accelerations, accelerograms. Okay, one of these I had given all the three directions. Okay, the Utkarshi one. Fine. So, as I told you, the peak ground acceleration is the measure of the maximum. Oh, this is the same slide, okay? It's the same slide. Let's skip it out. Now, one thing you have to remember in mind is that just because an amplitude is very high, okay? Just because an amplitude is very high means the value of acceleration, the peak acceleration is very high, doesn't mean that it is more damaging compared to a lower peak acceleration. Means you will have these pulses, okay, different pulses. 
and these different pulses have different amplitudes and the largest amplitude is called the peak uh, peak ground acceleration but uh, a corresponding value of the peak ground acceleration doesn't mean means if the value of amplitude is very high that doesn't mean that it is more damaging it also depends upon the duration okay it also depends upon the duration sometimes is that when even though the high peak acceleration may be less damaging compared to that of lower peak especially if the corresponding uh, duration of the pulse is very small because when the duration of the pulse is the duration of a, a pulse means a very high amplitude pulse is very small it means that the corresponding system has got very less time to respond okay so it will not cause that much great damage okay so it is not only the uh, amplitude of the pulse it is also the duration of the pulse that will affect the structure okay just by if uh, if you what you call just because a corresponding amplitude of the pulse is very high it doesn't mean that it is the most damaging okay we should look into the amplitude as well as the duration sometimes what happens is that if a, a slow amplitude uh, pulse having a greater duration will be more damaging compared to a high pulse amplitude of shorter duration okay so duration also plays a very important role okay just because it is peak doesn't mean that it is more more damaging now the next aspect is peak ground velocity so like the peak ground acceleration okay the peak ground velocity is the largest absolute velocity in that corresponding graph here okay when you take the usually velocities are velocity graphs are usually either obtained from the accelerogram okay or it may also be measured by certain instruments and in that the highest peak one is called as peak ground velocity okay now usually as i told you the peak ground velocity or the ground velocity is a, a measure of the energy that is transmitted to structure so sometimes what happens is that it is a better indicator of the damage to a structure okay it is a better indicator of a damage to the structure okay now the peak ground velocity okay or uh, the ground velocity as such is more sensitive to the intermediate frequency components okay of the motion and characteristics is response of structures that are sensitive to intermediate range of ground motions means the thing is that uh, the corresponding uh, ground velocity is more uh, useful to us especially for the uh, areas or especially for um, the time period when the frequency components is of intermediate value okay in that case uh, what happens is that it become it plays a very important role in analyzing the damage potential the third one is the peak ground displacement now it is the most inaccurate ground motion okay and uh, why because one thing is that it is mostly uh, derived from the accelerogram after two types of uh, uh, after uh, two stages of uh, filtering out okay so as such uh, we have to integrate the corresponding acceleration or accelerogram in order to obtain the displacement uh, uh, the seismogram okay not seismogram the corresponding displacement curve so as such uh, the errors due to the integration and sometimes what happens is that the long period noise okay there is filtering problems in there signal processing problems will be there so as such it is the most inaccurate uh, parameter for uh, ground motion information okay and this corresponding peak uh, 
displacement are more associated with the lower frequency components the velocity for the intermediate frequency components and the acceleration for the higher frequency components okay now just one minute um, remember one thing usually what happens is that the maximum amplitude the maximum amplitude of horizontal motions in the two directions that is uh, two horizontal directions is almost the same in most whether in most in displacement usually it is the same okay but in the vertical direction it will be usually less okay so as such uh, this corresponding thing is not for displacement okay okay this is actually for acceleration it should have come earlier sorry the slide has been misplaced okay so as such what happens is that uh, in most of the design course what usually is uh, taken is that the vertical design acceleration is usually expressed as two thirds of the horizontal acceleration. Okay, the vertical acceleration is taken as two thirds of the horizontal acceleration. Okay. That is what is usually done in the design code. We'll come to that later when we study the code. We'll come to that later part. Okay. Now the next important characteristics. So so far we have been discussing the peak ground motion. The next important characteristics is the duration. Now the duration is defined as the time interval in which 90 percentage of the total contribution to the energy of the accelerogram takes place. That means when I take an accelerogram, okay, I'll show you. Okay, for example, here when I take this accelerogram, the corresponding duration, okay, which in which almost 90 percentage of the energy is contributed okay 90 to 95 percentage okay that is taken as the duration of the strong motion okay so as such from the starting five percentage to 95 percentage is taken as the duration this is not required okay this point Okay, 90 percentage. The third one is the frequency content. Okay. And you see, so far we have been studying regarding the amplitude. Okay, the amplitude of the uh, acceleration, the amplitude of the velocity, the amplitude of the uh, what he called uh, um, uh, displacement, etc. But one aspect is very important is it not only as i told you it's not only the amplitude it is how frequent what is the frequency of that seismic wave that is also a great uh, characteristic okay and that is more important to us okay so as such when a seismic when a corresponding ground motion uh, is there on a, a site it consists of a range of frequencies okay uh, frequencies in the sense okay it may be very short frequencies or it may be larger frequencies okay short frequencies or larger frequencies so as such an earthquake that comes into a site it frequency in the sense uh, like this okay i hope you understand by the term frequency this is shorter frequency ones okay these longer frequency ones okay even though the amplitude is same in both okay the frequency is different in these two cases okay this having one frequency and this having another frequency okay so as such a number of approaches have been uh, discussed in the literature as we proposed the literature to properly estimate the frequency characteristics of the seismic waves or of the ground motion okay the three important ones that are, we shall look into is the response spectra, the Fourier spectra, and the power spectra. Okay. Now, uh, this slightly it, it, it may look a bit complicated as such. Okay, but bear with me. Okay. Now, uh, 
A response spectra is actually a plot showing the peak response induced by a ground motion. Okay, the peak response induced by a ground motion in a single degree of freedom system or SDOF system. Okay, in an SDOF system of different fundamental time periods having the same damping. Okay different uh, uh, structures having different fundamental time periods but having the same damping this is known as a response spectrum now this response okay this response which you are measuring the peak value can either be acceleration it can be a velocity or it can be a displacement okay and they are named as uh, acceleration spectrum velocity spectrum and displacement spectrum uh, as such okay now the response spectrum among the three methods okay the response spectra for a spectra and power spectra the most favored one is the response spectra especially for earthquake engineers okay for earthquake engineers the most favored one is the response spectra because response spectra is the one which is uh, which most codes most of the design codes use okay we'll come to that later this is the corresponding re response spectrum is the corresponding input that most design codes use in order to estimate the corresponding earthquake parameters okay now one thing is that i told you the maximum value the maximum value means maximum displacement or velocity or acceleration it depends upon the natural time period or frequency of the structure and the damping ratio for a single degree of freedom system for a single sdof system the corresponding parameters the peak values okay the maximum values will be depending upon the damping ratio as well as the natural period of frequency okay now these maximum values okay of displacement velocity and acceleration are also called as spectral acceleration spectral velocity and spectral displacement denoted by sa sv and sd okay means the maximum magnitude of acceleration velocity and displacement as such they are referred to as spectral acceleration spectral velocity and spectral displacement okay now as i told you each these maximum values depend upon the natural period of frequency and the damping ratio so as such you can see in in a, in the curves usually for different values of damping okay the curves will be separate and for the different time periods 1 2 3 4 5 6 the value is different okay uh, we will discuss uh, will uh, come to know regarding this when you construct a, a response spectra now so as such i told you that the corresponding diagrams okay that plot the uh, sd sv and sa okay remember one thing this actually is the peak value okay uh, let me show you another figure here okay here you see this is a corresponding uh, graph of a uh, corresponding seismic wave or seismic uh, uh, response of a sdf system and the peak value of this placement is what is on this curve okay the peak the peak value of a uh, sdof with time period 1.5 is what is on this curve the peak value of a corresponding uh, sdof system with time period t equal to 3 seconds is what is on this curve so this curve is the corresponding curve that connects the peaks okay that is what is actually indicated by this okay okay the corresponding peaks okay as such that uh, line or that curve joining the peaks is what is actually the response spectra. Now, now as such, this uh, so the maximum values, the SD, SV, and SA all all sometimes called as uh, the SV. SV is called a spectral. I'm sorry, uh, SV is called a spectral velocity. Sorry, sorry. 
the spectral velocity and spectral acceleration is also called as pseudo spectral velocity and pseudo spectral acceleration okay because what happens is that this corresponding sv and sa does not exactly represent the peak velocity value sometimes what happens is that it may not represents the peak velocity value because as i told you it also depends upon the damping factor so as such it may not actually represents the peak velocity so sometimes it is instead of calling exactly spectral velocity or spectral displacement or spectral acceleration people use the word pseudo spectral velocity or pseudo spectral acceleration that is a better term okay pseudo spectral velocity standard textbooks we use that term pseudo spectral velocity and pseudo spectral acceleration okay so this is the corresponding you can see the spe spectral acceleration pseudo spectral acceleration graph okay that is this one the pseudo spectral velocity graph that is this one this the displacement displacement as such there is no need of pseudo because as such displacement will give you the maximum value so this is the spectral displacement graph and uh, i think the adr spectral value is also given okay this we for the time being we are not in uh, looking into adrs will discuss that later we are it's a bit complicated we are not going to that part okay now remember one thing whether it is the deformation spectral uh, deformation or pseudo spectral velocity or pseudo acceleration they contain the same information just different ways of representing it. that's only what the difference is the information that contain is the same thing okay the pseudo spec deformation spectrum as such will give you the peak deformation of the system okay the pseudo velocity spectrum is related to the peak strain energy okay as i told you earlier the uh, velocity as such is related to the energy so as such the pseudo spectral spectrum the pseudo velocity spectrum will is related to the peak strain energy that is stored in the system remember one thing here here we are concerned with the response of a structure we are not concerned with the ground itself okay we are concerned with the response of a structure as such that is why it's called a response spectrum okay we are not concerned with the ground motion itself how the ground motion affects a structure a single degree of freedom system structure okay that is what we are concerned okay and then the pseudo acceleration spectrum that is equivalent to the stat equivalent static force okay usually we refer to this corresponding thing is what is uh, usually given in quotes okay the pseudo acceleration spectrum and from which we can obtain the static equivalent static force okay that acts on a structure okay we'll discuss that later for time being when it comes to the design aspects okay we'll come to that part so as such it is uh, different the information content is the same but there are different ways of expressing it that's all okay and then they are interrelated to each other okay so you can see that sd so spectral displacement is equal to 1 by omega into sv is equal to t uh, 1 by omega is actually uh, as such is t by 2 pi okay you are studying regarding the frequency okay omega is frequency t is the time period okay that is as such equal to the maximum displacement that is sd sd is what as i told you it's the maximum displacement x max approximately not exact approximately equal to maximum displacement now sv spectral velocity is equal to omega into sd okay or omega is 2 pi by t into sd and sa is equal to omega square into sd or 2 pi by t whole square into sd so all these sd sv and sa are interrelated to each other now how do we construct it's actually construction okay the construction of a response spectrum involves the analysis of many sdof systems okay many sdof systems because sdof systems of different time periods okay we should have the sdof systems of different time periods and the corresponding value of each point on the spectrum is the peak response of a single degree of freedom system of a given time period okay so for a time period say t equals 0.5 seconds 
the peak value as such is what we measure here, given here. And for a, a structure of time period, say t equals one second, the or 1.5 second, we take the peak value here. And for a time period t equals three second, we take the peak value here. So as such, that is how this corresponding uh, curve has been generated. Okay, this is for displacement. Okay, this is for displacement. Similarly, we can get a similar one for acceleration also. Okay, the peak value as such. Okay, so you can see here the different SDOF systems. Okay, SDOF systems. Okay, with having different time periods. Okay, and each of these corresponding structures is given the same input input uh, ground motion okay okay the, as i told you earlier that response spectra is the resultant spec uh, response of a sdf system okay after giving an input of the seismic uh, of the ground motion so the input motion is what is given here uh, when this input motion is given what is the corresponding value of the spectrum uh, that is obtained here that is what we get it and that too it depends upon for each of these values okay for uh, maybe a damping equals one percentage two percentage three percent etc we get different curves okay we get different curves for each of these dampings okay we get different curves so now i told you that it may not always be the top peak why because we may be taking at any one of these sections here okay so depending upon that uh, uh, that is also a factor we, i'm not going to much detail regarding the uh, response spectra becomes a bit mathematically involved okay in standard textbooks okay you will see the equations as such how how the corresponding spectrum equations has been derived i'm not going to the mathematics part for the time being so as such, just uh, understand this figure if you understand this figure you can approximate idea of what do you mean by a response spectra now response spectra can be for displacement okay it can and it can be for velocity also it can be for acceleration also okay so how to construct it okay we first have different sdf systems and then we take the peak okay the peak of the value of the corresponding re uh, response spectrum when an input of ground motion is given to it okay and that value, as I told you, it depends upon the corresponding uh, damping. This one. So, as such, for one percentage, two percentage, five percent, etc., there are different curves here. Okay, you can see these curves here, as such. Now, now, as I told you, the response is also dependent upon the site conditions. Okay. Site conditions that is so and the corresponding location and magnitude of earthquake and distance the, all the characteristics which as i told you earlier on which the ground motion depends that will also affect the spectrum okay so all the corresponding characteristics on which the ground motion are uh, depends parameters the ground motion parameters it depends this also affects the response spectrum okay in general the motion on rock contains more short period content of motion compared to that in soil. What this has been observed is that in if you consider the motion of a rock, it has more short period content, to, uh, frequency content compared to that of a soil. Okay. And the response spectra from a low magnitude event at a closer distance will be rich in higher frequency. If the corresponding earthquake is located or earthquake has happened nearby, okay, the response spectrum will of that corresponding earthquake will have a higher frequency components compared to that of an earthquake which has been I mean, compared to a large earthquake which has occurred at a very large distance. Okay. So even if an earthquake is a small, okay, if an earthquake is small, but it is located at a closer distance, it will have greater frequency content compared to a large earthquake that has occurred at a large distance. 
So, you see the peak ground acceleration, the velocity and displacement of different earthquakes will differ. Okay. So, uh, usually in, in code, there is a single graph that is given. Okay. A single graph that has been given in course that is actually a normalized one. Okay. A normalized one by studying the corresponding response spectrum of different earthquakes that has been uh, occurred in the past. Because it has been observed that the response spectra is almost of almost all the earthquakes turns out to be similar. Okay. That is the main advantage. Okay. The main advantage of response spectrum approach is that the earthquakes that look quite different when represented in the time domain may actually contain the similar frequency contents and hence a similar response spectra. Okay. That is the advantage of why you're using, using a similar response spectra. So when you get a similar response spectra as such, Studying all the corresponding response spectra of the different earthquakes based upon the study of all the corresponding response spectra of all the different earthquakes, a design response spectra curve is given in the course. That is a design, uh, extra word design will come in front of that. So, as such, the response spectra of different earthquakes, if you look into it, it's almost similar. Based upon the studying of all these response spectra, code specifies a response spectra. Okay that encompasses all these response spectras. Okay. And remember one thing, this response spectra for an earthquake is unique. Okay, that is unique to that earthquake. So, uh, as such, you can see, get the response spectra of uh, the corresponding um, different earthquakes from the internet. Okay. So, this normalization is done. Okay, once you get the corresponding response spectra of the different earthquakes normalization is done whether it is usually this acceleration or it can be also be done for velocity and uh, uh, displacement also or in code it is the acceleration response spectrum that is provided in most codes okay. the normalized acceleration response uh, spectrum the next one is the fourier spectra uh, another common uh, spectra which is used is a uh, Fourier spectra. The Fourier spectra is actually a plot of the Fourier amplitude that is of uh, input time history versus the time period. Okay. Or it is of frequency. It can be either a time period or frequency. You can either use a time period at the bottom. Okay. On the x-axis it may be either be a time period or it may be frequency. Okay. So Fourier amplitude of the input time history versus the time period or the frequency. This is known as a Fourier spectrum. Okay. Now the shape of the Fourier spectra is related to the seismic moment. Okay. So it is also a good way of understanding the ground motion characteristics. Okay. Here it is not, remember what here it is not uh, the response. Okay. Here it is not a response of structure. It is actually the ground motion itself. Okay. Now the Fourier analysis provides both amplitude and phase angles okay depending upon that it is called a fourier amplitude spectrum or a fourier phase spectrum here is the corresponding figure here so here you can see here it is it is given in frequency not in time period and here in it can be represented either in terms of the phase angle or in terms of the amplitude both are called so this is called a fourier amplitude spectra and this is called a Fourier phase spectra. This was the same thing, okay? One, it may, one in terms of angle or phase, we call it, the other in terms of the frequency, okay? Now, usually what happens is that the phase is generally considered as lesser importance compared to that of the amplitude. In most uh, textbooks, you will find only this amplitude one, okay? This is usually not given in textbooks. But it is almost the same uh, measurement. Okay. Okay. It is almost the same thing. But usually in most textbooks, the amplitude, Fourier amplitude spectra is usually given. Okay. So when I, uh, when you Google out Fourier spectra, it will usually give you this amplitude spectra with respect to frequency. Generally, frequency is used 
instead of time period. In most of the textbooks, it is frequency. Okay. Now, the Fourier amplitude spectra of velocity and displacement. Usually, uh, in textbook, uh, one more thing is that in most uh, textbooks, it is the amplitude is actually the acceleration amplitude. Okay, acceleration amplitude that is given to you. So. From this acceleration amplitude, we can also get the Fourier amplitude spectra of velocity as well as displacement. Okay, by dividing the acceleration of Fourier amplitude spectrum by the frequency and square of the frequency respectively. We have already studied it earlier. Okay, if you have the amplitude, amplitude divided by one frequency will give you the velocity, and the amplitude divided by frequency square will give you uh, displacement. Okay, so the displacement spectra, the Fourier displacement spectra and the Fourier velocity spectra can be obtained by dividing the amplitude. Okay, so as such you will get a curve. Okay, if you divide the corresponding amplitude by frequency, so at each corresponding point you will get this curve for velocity. Okay, and then the displacement. If you divide once with frequency, you will get velocity. If you divide it by the square of frequency, then you will get displacement. Okay. And usually what happens is that uh, Fourier spectra as such, you see in this corresponding figure, you see is 0 0.0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is given in linear scale. But usually the Fourier spectra is sometimes maybe uh, given in uh, logarithm scale also. Okay. In order to understand the general nature of the spectra, the smoothened Fourier spectra of displacement, velocity and acceleration have been plotted in a logarithm scale. Okay. The logarithm scale is given three different. I told you it can be in terms of uh, displacement, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. In most textbooks or in most cases, the acceleration is given from which, if you divide by frequency, you get uh, velocity, and from this, if you again divide by frequency, you get displacement. Okay. Now, one thing is that the Fourier spectra can either be narrow or it can be broad. It can either be narrow or broad. Okay. The narrow spectrum is usually in case of very soft soil. It has been observed that the narrow spectra is usually observed in case of very soft soil. Okay. While the corresponding hard, hard soil will give you a broad band for your spectra. Okay. A broad band for your spectra. Now you can also represent the next, uh, you can also represent the frequency content in terms of the power spectra. This is the third one. Okay. This power spectrum or it's also called as power spectral density function. PSDF. Yeah, sometimes it's called as power spectral density function. Okay. It's almost closely related to the uh, Fourier uh, spectra and you can also establish a relationship between Okay, the power spectrum and the Fourier spectrum, Fourier amplitude spectrum. You should just call us Fourier amplitude spectra. Okay, why? Because I told you the phase is not usually generally adopted. So it's usually called Fourier amplitude. Fourier phase as such, uh, is, uh, you will not find as such anywhere in most cases. It's usually amplitude is provided. Okay, so power spectra and Fourier uh, amplitude spectra can be related by this e equation where epsilon is actually a mathematical express expectation operator. Okay, I'm not going to that detail part. Okay, it's actually a mathematical expression operator. Uh, so if you look in standard textbooks, you will see derivations and other all things. Okay, we are not going to that level of detail. Okay. Now, one thing is that the power spectral density is uh, not only a measure of the frequency content even though i had given in the frequency content okay it is not only a measure of speaker frequency content but it's also a measure of its statistical properties okay of how an earthquake chance of earthquake will happen okay it's also a measure of a the a, the statistical properties of a probabilities of an earthquake okay mm -hmm. Then it has been observed that the power spectral density, 
for horizontal motion will have a sharper peak and will have a lesser a span that is over lesser narrower frequency compared to that of a vertical motion okay and as i told you the power spectra is also depends upon the soil conditions okay so i think uh, with this we can mm, here you can see okay the psd this is for horizontal motion this is for a vertical motion and even for horizontal motion for different types of soil it is different okay and you can see the difference even for alluvium if i take alluvium the psdf for alluvium is different in case of horizontal motion compared to that of vertical motion it is more flat in case of vertical motion okay so as such it depends upon the side conditions okay and it depends upon which you are taking whether you are taking the psd of vertical or whether you are taking psd of the horizontal so i think with this uh, we'll wind up this session the design ground motion parameters will come uh, we'll discuss it later when we come to the code okay as i told you the ground motion parameters that are used in the design of structures are these three one is the peak ground acceleration pga the second one is the design response spectrum okay and then the acceleration time history graph these are the three general uh, aspects uh our ground motion parameters that are used for the design part okay we had now studied not for the design part but in the design part it is these corresponding three things are the major uh, aspects okay we will discuss more about this when we come to the design part okay then i think with this uh, we will you know, wind up the session is there any questions you can ask